I've come to embrace using AI to help me in my day-to-day -day job as a software engineer. I'll break down four of the different ways that I use it and the tools that I choose for each of these specific areas. Code generation, troubleshooting, prototyping, and learning. Now, none of these tools or sites are sponsoring me, by the way. These are genuinely what I use on a day-to-day -day basis based on what has been the most productive for me. Anyway, let's get into it. Starting with the first one, code generation. Here you'll see I have an application open in VS Code, and I have the Copilot extension installed and configured. I'll add a new case to my enum, and if I go down to my match and want to add a new line for this processing blog status, I can rely on Copilot to fill in something pretty quickly. It's not exactly impressive, but over time, little boilerplate fixes like these add up to a good amount of time saved. Another example is this class method that I have here, and I want to change the returned value. I'll throw in a comment for what I expect to see and start the new line. Then I have Copilot generate the rest for me. This is handy if I'm not sure of the exact syntax of a built-in function, or I'm unsure of the most efficient way of solving something. I've also tweaked Copilot so it's not always displaying completions, as it tends to be distracting. So I've set up this keyboard shortcut that fires off the recommendations instead. Now that's handy for generating a few lines of code or less, but what if we wanted something more complicated? How about a whole action class called generate blog? I have an array of transcripts coming through and I want to use an open AI library to create a blog post out of them. So I lay out comments based on what I want to see this function do. And I can open up the inline chat window and tell Copilot to convert these comments into working code. Now what it gave me is pretty good. Although it includes this generate blog post method that doesn't exist, which is where the bulk of the work will be located apparently. So I'll go ahead and create the function, and in the empty body, I'll have Copilot try and generate some code for it. It gives me some, but this isn't really doing much. It's trying to call a generate blog post method on the AI library that I have installed, but that doesn't exist, so this is effectively useless. When the complexity increases like this, or I need a larger amount of code generated, I start reaching for another tool, Claude. Let's provide it with some context and a prompt for this function body and see what it gives me. All right, we got a good sized function body that seems to actually be using the library dependency that I've been using throughout the rest of the application. And it gave me some background on the sidebar about what the function's doing and things to keep in mind while using it. After I put this into my app, I realized something though. I could be hitting a token limit if these blog sections are too long. So I'll ask Claude what I can do to avoid this. And it gives me back a modified function body, along with some info behind its decision. Now this definitely seems like something that should be covered by a unit test though. And like most developers, I hate writing tests. This is a huge area where AI comes out on top. So I'll ask Claude to write me a test for this function using PHP unit. And I get back an entire testing class file, which looks pretty solid. So let's add that into the app's test directory. Now there's a few issues that my editor is seeing with this, so that can bring us into our next use case for AI, troubleshooting. For something simple like this undefined property, I can highlight the line of code and ask Copilot why this is showing an error. It tells me it's because I need to declare the mock property, and it just goes ahead and adjusts the code for me. Simple enough. But this one is a bit more complicated. The method that we're trying to test resides in a different class, so let's see if Copilot has a fix for that as well. A one line change and we're good to go. Now our test file is error free. It's true that both of these cases were pretty trivial though and might be identified and resolved in about the same amount of time as it took me to run these prompts. So let's focus on something just a little bit more complex. Like this open issue that I have for this app. It says that VTT subtitles aren't being spaced properly. I know in my app that this will be in the generate subtitles class. I'll open up Copilot chat in that file and provide it with the error and some basic context. All right, it says that I can use str replace on the output, creating a formatted transcript variable that I can use instead. That's simple enough, I should have thought of that. But wait, it's not, it's not a space that I need to add. Based on the ticket, it's actually a whole new line. The AI didn't know that though, so I have to provide it with more context. And it's just telling me to add an additional line break where one already exists. So I can just copy this code over, and if my tests run green, that's good to go out. Now for troubleshooting issues that are a bit more abstract, I reach for OpenAI's Playground. 
This way I can provide an overall system context with what's going on, as well as how I want the AI to act. In this example, I'm having problems with Docker. So I want the AI to act as a system architect who's well-versed in containerized infrastructure. And then I ask my question. I get back a huge list of things to try to resolve my issue, 10 different items in total. And I can pivot too. I can ask it a different question that goes along the same path, or in this example, provide an error message coming back from my terminal. And it goes through the same process, outputting helpful steps that I can take while retaining the original question's context. That's why the potential solutions it's now giving me are still relevant to Mac OS, which I referenced in the original question. Probably the biggest use I've found for AI that I keep coming back to though is prototyping, specifically rapidly scaffolding experimental code or reusable components way faster than I could do on my own. For this, I almost always use Claude because of its embedded artifacts where you can see live code in action without having to switch to another window. So I'll provide a prompt, say that I want a keyboard component built with React and Tailwind CSS that emits the key pressed on it and has a sleek modern look. In a few moments, not only do I have my component's code, but I also have a live preview of it that I can interact with, as well as both an explanation for the component itself and how to integrate it into an existing React application. This is arguably the most impressive and useful tool for me, especially as someone who works on side projects and creates tutorial content. I can also iterate over this as well by adding a new prompt. Let's say that I want the keyboard component to react to actual keys pressed on a physical keyboard too. It'll generate a whole new version of the component that I can test out and provides updated details just like before. Something even crazier is that I can provide a crude wireframe like this one that I threw together for a video player platform and ask Claude to generate the HTML for it. Just like before, it'll generate the entire code and let me preview it in this side window. Now, actually, there's an ongoing bug when it comes to using the Tailwind CDN though, so that's why nothing here is styled, and I have to switch to Safari to see some of these previews because of that. Hopefully that'll be fixed in the future, but there we go. My video player in all its glory from my two minute drawing. And just like the React component, I can iterate on this by asking for changes, and it will regenerate the code for me with a new preview. The best part about this is that I can switch between the versions of the code that were written during this conversation. So if there's something that I like from a particular iteration, I can copy it or reference it in future conversations. Now, something to note is that, as is, this isn't something that I'd put into production, but it's pretty decent especially for basic layouts where I'm working on demo applications or as a starting point for something more serious. It takes a lot of the monotonous initial work out and instead lets me focus on details and polish. The final area I wanna talk about is how I use AI to learn as a software engineer. I'm a very visual and interactive learner, so my go-to is still YouTube videos and diving into code bases to play around. However, for more general or abstract topics, I find myself using OpenAI's chat playground more and more. Just like I did with the troubleshooting section, I provide a system context to the AI. In this case, I want an engineer with more seniority than myself who's good at being helpful and breaking down complicated concepts. Now let's find out more about dependency injection, a topic that has evaded my understanding for quite some time. I get back a massive amount of text that starts with the overall concept, and then breaks it into practical examples using common languages like Java and Python. I don't know these, and I could have specified a particular language, but this still gets the point across. Unlike reading blog posts or Stack Overflow questions about this topic, I don't have to go back and adjust my search if I want more details or to meander into a related topic. If I ask about service containers, for example, it'll continue the conversation and knowledge dump and pull references from the last topic which is great because the two are related. I can continue down the rabbit hole, just kind of going in a direction that I want to, and not one that's dictated by just the content available to me. This has been exceptionally beneficial for learning new programming languages. As someone who learns the most by doing, I can get a roadmap for completing a goal in a language that's wholly unfamiliar to me. 
Now I can go through each of these high level bullet points and get more information either from the internet as a whole or from the same conversation. So yeah, that's how I use AI tools in my day-to-day -day workflow. I'm always looking for a way to increase my efficiency and productivity as a developer. And I stayed away from AI for a while because I thought it was lazy or cheap. But really it's no different than using an IDE over a plain text editor. It's the next iteration of autocomplete or a helper. I don't believe that AI will replace developers anytime soon. And I have an article that I wrote talking about this linked in the description below if you wanna read it. But I do think that if you are not using these tools as they become more and more common, you're more likely to be left behind by developers who do. If you have any questions about anything you saw in this video, please let me know in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.